Uh, we'll be resuming our Saturday night, link night. To, uh, this week will be our praise and prayer night. And as always, we have our Wednesday night prayers every week on Wednesdays at 7.30 on Zoom. And this week, we have our Good Friday service, which will be on Zoom. So I hope to see everyone out there. Come out, everybody. Yeah, I'll be there. Soul Joseph. And then we also have our combat confirmation baptism still going on for signups. So that'll be on, that starts on uh, April 18th for five weeks, and they'll be happening after church at 1.30 p.m. Yeah, so that's for five weeks. So if you're a junior or senior, uh, make sure you sign up for that before it's too late. And yeah, and also, of course, next week we have our Easter Sunday in person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I hope you guys all are planning to come out. I hope to see Many of you guys here in person, face to face. Yeah, we're all excited. Even if I don't sound excited, I'm very excited on the inside. So yeah, uh, please welcome up Haley for a time of prayer now. Oh yeah. Thank you, Joseph.
Yeah, Father in heaven, we, yeah, come on this Sunday with so much freedom and joy. God, that one day in your court is really better, Father, than anything in this world can offer us. I just pray that your spirit will be among us as I preach. Father, that your spirit will allow us to hear these words. Lord, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Praise team. All right. Amen. Wearing this mic like Pete Dan said the first time we were, it feels really weird. All right. But yes, Pete Dan is gone. That's, we should have also, we'll pray for him at later that he's having a good restful time back at home. But today I have the honor of preaching the word and I am filled with a lot of joy to be able to do this. What an opportunity it is to give you guys all right, and so last week, Pekin gave us a word, and then the week before, we actually left off on Galatians 3, 14, if you remember, and so today, we're going to be going through 15 to 29, all right? It's a little bit, a lot of verses. Um, I was contemplating on how much of this to give, but I feel like this whole section creates a bigger picture of who Jesus is, and so I really chose it because next week is going to be Easter, and so this kind of gives this backstory of the story of Jesus, okay? It gives us this full context of uh, what really made Jesus so special rather than just looking at the day um, that he dies and, come, and he comes back, which we'll most likely talk about next week. And so the, the main point that I wanted to teach upon today is that we are made alive in our faith in Jesus, and through faith we are part of the inheritance first given to Abraham. 
So that's what we're going to be talking about today, right? And so, actually, you could put that up later. Not yet. Just a song. Um, I just wanted us to go back into uh, why Paul was writing to Galatia because it is important. So he was writing to Galatia because he previously visited this city, right? He evangelized them, the story of Jesus, for them to believe in Jesus. And so they were filling up with this Holy Spirit, and they're the new Christians, right? They were fresh on the scene, uh, learning about Jesus and what it meant to follow Jesus, right? And so once Paul left, because he couldn't stay there forever, these new group of people came in and started to preach their gospel. And so these guys were the people who believed in the law, Right? They were called like Judaizers. They had a lot of different terms back then. But these guys were influencing these new Christians to believing that to maintain the covenant that God gave us is to follow the law. Right? And so we know that through the past sermons and stuff that we are not justified by following the law. But these Galatians, that's what they started to believe. And so that's why Paul is continuing to uh, yell at them through this letter that it is not by works, but by faith, right? And that we receive the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus. That's what Predan talked about two weeks ago, right? It is through the Holy Spirit that we get given through faith and faith alone. Not by works, not by any of that other jazz. And so, Joseph, if you could put up the first picture. Boom, I made this, guys. Woo! So this is a little timeline, okay? We're gonna, so we're going to be looking, starting here in Abraham, and then just be looking to Jesus and why Abraham is related to Jesus in this whole story of the resurrection and all this stuff. And so we're going to start in verse 15 of chapter 3. This is the Word of God. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings. That's an S. Referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it is no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So this is our first little section that I want to go into. So this is the beginning, right? After the creation, after the fall, God chose Abraham to, you know, be his people, right? And so the covenant that God made with Abraham right on here, I really didn't make this picture just so I could do this in point. I think this is fun. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's loud. All right. Uh, I lost my point. Okay, yeah, so this first covenant, this Abrahamic covenant, right, it was of faith. God made this covenant with Abraham that if Abraham believed in God, that he would receive the three different things, right, the land of promise and inheritance. He would have many peop- many uh, uh, descendants and all these things, right? This was the covenant that God gave to Abraham, right? There's no law yet. There's nothing of this middle following all these uh, Ten Commandments and stuff, but God gave this to Abraham made this covenant, you know, faith in me, right? And so when we, when God makes a covenant with his people, when God makes a promise, God does not not follow this promise, right? It says in this, in this uh, chapter 5, or verse 15, right? Once a covenant has been made, nothing will change this original covenant. Nothing will change this original promise, right? So when God made this promise to Abraham of covenant of faith, Nothing in between, nothing in between will ever change that, right? It is still through faith that this covenant will come, right? And in in the latter part, it points to these couple of things, right? If you actually look back in Genesis 12, chapter 12, it's the first uh, call of Abraham, right? And if you look in the latter sections, it continuously says this, um, that God will bless him with an offspring, right? Not offsprings, but a single offspring, and so back then, even in this beginning, as you see right here, offspring, he's pointing to a singular person who's going to save the world, right? Who's going to fulfill this covenant, and that is Jesus. So even back then, in the beginning, God was pointing to Jesus, right? And so that is what this covenant is. That is what the covenant is and is still present, right? That no 
nothing in this world will break that. Nothing in God's mind will change or annul or, or move around this, this thing that God promised to Abraham and to his people. Right? He, God made this a promise that was given to Abraham. And so this covenant is what really brings us alive later. Right? And so when we looked in verses 17, this is the kind of part that these Galatians are having a struggle with. They're not understanding what's proper, properly what's happening because these people have come in and told them that to maintain this covenant, they have to follow the law, right? But the law, like it said in verse 17, came 430, I put 20 up there, but it's 430 years after, right? God made this covenant, took 430 years, and then the law came. It is actually more than 430, um, but this is just, it's just, it's just details that's not as important, but 430 years, right? So this law came after this first covenant of faith, right? And when we keep reading in verse 20, we're going to start in 19 and then keep going a little bit more, right? Why then the law? This is a question. Peter or Paul always asks these questions. It was added because of transgression until the author to who? who? Am I cutting out? Whatever. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Intermediary, he's talking about Moses. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Right. We're going to keep going. Verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the, comp the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. And so it's talking about here, right? Moses came to bring the law, right? God used Moses as an intermediary to bring this law. But the question that, I, that comes about, right, is why did we need this law? What was the point of this law, right? What did it do in this story, in this narrative of Jesus and everything that God is doing in this world, right? And we see that Paul is writing this law that was given was a placeholder for the world till Jesus arrives, right? Let's see, in, verse, in Deuteronomy, actually, chapter 31, verse 29. It's funny. This is what Moses is saying about the law. For I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly, turn aside from the ways that I have commanded you, and in the days to come evil will befall you, because you will do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger through the works of your hand. So God gave us this law to be a disciplinarian. That's what it says in different contexts and different uh, translations of the Bible. This ESV says guardian. But the, the Hebrew, no, the Greek word is, it's, it's pedagogos. I don't know how to say it. I looked it up, but that's the closest I got. And what this disciplinarian meant in this context was that a household slave's job was to guide a family's male children, children back and forth to school. So that's what this law was meant to do. It wasn't meant to bring anything of freedom of sorts, but it was really just to show what it means to follow Jesus, or to follow God in this way, right? It was a disciplinarian. It was used to kind of guide the people of Israel, right? Because at this point, in 430 years after the covenant was made, the Israelite people were freed from slavery because of uh, 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 Moses, right? And so they came out of this, and so they had to kind of relearn, right? And that's what this law served. That's what the purpose of this law was, right? It was to, to guide them, right? Guide them to understanding what it meant. And so, you know, why didn't, why couldn't have Jesus has come in and taken away and not done any of these law stuff, not led to any of this controversy, not led to the people being confused and why, and, um, yeah, the law almost taking capture of a lot of people's hearts, right? We can look in Romans 3.20 for this, right? 
in this verse it says, For by the works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So what Paul previously wrote, right, that this law served a purpose for us. It, it showed us purpose to uh, reveal what sin was, right? And so that's why we needed this law. That's why we needed this period to uh, understand and, and follow these things, right? The covenant was made through faith. The Mosaic law showed the people uh, what sin was. It kind of revealed them what sin is. Like when you have these rules and when you have these laws, you can understand when you're falling away from it, right? Kind of set these clear boundaries. And these people really, they didn't understand what it meant to follow God, right? And then they kind of, there are periods of time when they began to really worship God and glorify Him and have faith, but they were constantly falling away, right? And so we really see throughout all of Israel and through all of these texts that the law, it, it does nothing. Or it, does, it, does, it has its purpose, right? But it doesn't bring us this freedom. It doesn't maintain this covenant like the people had previously thought and that the people think in Galatia, right? It was just a little placeholder. It was just uh, used to reveal our sin, right? How can we know what's wrong if we don't know what's right? And so that's what this Mosaic Law did. And then now we're going to continue reading towards the end of this chapter. If you actually read this whole section, it has, a, it has a bunch of different verses that you can pluck out and stuff. But this is just the narrative that and perspective I wanted to show us as we're coming into Easter and focusing just on the context of Jesus, right? And how everything points to him. So if we keep reading... Chapter 26, or no, chapter 3, verse 26. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Boom. Through Christ Jesus, we are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So when Jesus came, there's way more power than what, uh, if you just singularly look at what happened, right? He was mocked, he was uh, done all this, he was the perfect person and died, right? That in itself is so great and gives us so much power and joy, right? But this extra context is, is I, found so, I found it so cool, right? Everything from the beginning of this covenant, covenant, point, that was very Korean, covenant, covenant pointed to Jesus, right? <laughs> Right, and when the covenant was previously given to Abraham, it pointed to a singular offspring who would free us, who faith in this offspring, a.k.a. Jesus, would bring us into the heirs, and we would be a part of this promise that was first given to Abraham, right? That if we believe in Jesus, we too would have faith, or if we have faith in Jesus, we too would fall into this inheritance that was given to Abraham. And so that's what partly what Jesus did, right? Why when Jesus came, it was so special and how we are truly made alive by faith in Jesus, right? Because faith in Jesus, like it says in this passage, makes us, allows us to be also in this inheritance of Abraham. We are also a part of this family. We are also a part of this whole church and this whole body, right? Through our faith in Jesus, not because of this law, not because of anything else, but because God he, he, he made that covenant. He made the covenant to tell him that the singular person was going to come and save all of us, right? And so that's his whole past, right? That's his, not a whole, there's a lot more to it, but this is the gist of what's going on when Jesus came. This is the gist of what Paul's telling the people, right? You have to believe, you have to have faith. It is not by your works, right? The works are just meant to show us our sin. And Jesus, Jesus, faith in Jesus was the one who actually freed us, right? Faith in Jesus is what makes us alive. All right. So when Jesus came, it was a time when the world was transgressing, right? They were falling away. They needed Jesus to free them, right? That this law was not bringing them the life that they all have wanted, right? So when we believe in Jesus, when we have faith in Jesus, we are all heirs, right? How, how great, how awesome is that? Verse 29, and if you are Christ then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And when you believe in Jesus, verse 28, the previous verse, it says that we're all the same, right? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female that you are all one in Christ. When we believe in Jesus, who fulfills this covenant, right? This, who fulfills this covenant that Abraham gave to us, 
all these boundaries, all these barriers are nothing, right? This verse was very, very powerful and controversial to them, right? Think about it. If you're in this context where you believe the law is what sets us free, when you believe that everybody has a different place, that slaves, whatever, women should be suppressed, all these things, and Paul writes, hey, doesn't matter in, the, in this family of Jesus, in the family that God is calling us into, as long as we have faith, there's no, there's no boundaries, right? We are all one in Christ. We are all justified by faith, right? That following Jesus frees us from law and brings us into this inheritance, right? And so you can go into the next slide, Joseph. And so now we're going to get into a little bit of the so what's, right? So what does this show us? What does this reveal to us, right? Why did Paul write this thing? Why and how does this relate to who we are, right? That G, so it is, so this is a so what? You know, Jesus was needed to free us from our sin. So now faith in Jesus who defied all of earth's rules gives us freedom, not the law. All right, when we looked at this whole context of what was going on with all these things in the past and with Israel, the people of God, the God's chosen people, he set everything up so wonderfully, so perfectly, right? You look at this as a whole, like as a whole story of Jesus in the beginning, right? How much more can we see of God's sovereignty, right? How much more a joy can we find in knowing how special Jesus really is, right? And how much power he holds and how much power his death holds for us. It frees us from everything. It frees us from all this, right? Just simply by faith, simply by believing, right? And that's this week what gave me a lot of joy as I was preparing this message, right? I worked like, it was like 36 hours at a coffee shop this week, which is a lot of hours, but in the midst of all this, like, talking with people and doing work, and, like, it was super busy, I just was filled so much joy, knowing, right, simply by faith, knowing that we are all a part of, in this family, that we are all uh, free, right? Jesus defied all the rules. He broke all the laws so that we can be free. Right, and so the second point, you can go to the next one, Joseph. When we think about Jesus, it is not all about death. His suffering for us was a perfect sacrifice, but that our faith in him brings us alive into the inheritance of his kingdom. That was a little long, right? But this is that joy I'm talking about, right? When we think of Jesus, sometimes uh, I even find myself doing this. You know, we think about his death, how we should almost, there's not, there's like this inferiority complex, right? Because God and Jesus was so good to us, you know, it makes us feel less happy, right? But that's not really what Jesus wants. That's not what God wants, right? He did all these things so that we can be free, so that we can receive this inheritance, right? That we can receive his promises, that we are heirs to his promise, right? That Abraham's covenant was fulfilled through Jesus, and in that, that's what brings us alive. That's what brings us uh, so much joy, right? This promise, right? It's so simple. There's nothing to it. There's a lot to it, but just faith, right? Faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. So, yeah, that, that's, that's this whole story of, of Jesus, right? I said Jesus like a lot of times because that is who we cling on to, right? When the covenant came, it pointed to Jesus to come. And he, God knew all that was going to happen in the middle of the story. He knew how the law was going to come, and it's going to uh, reveal so much sin, and how a lot of people are going to become chained to the law, right? But as we look th- through this whole cycle and what Jesus did, yeah, it shows us that we are a part of this covenant. The covenant thousands of years before, we also hold that same power, that same uh, a promise, right, that was given to Abraham. We are sons of Abraham because of our faith in Jesus. We are daughters of Abraham because of faith in Jesus, right? And all that, we are also are going to be given this inheritance, right? The inheritance of his kingdom. Although it's going to look hard and it's going to be difficult on our time on earth, right? That's what is given to us. That's the promise that is given to us. And that should be our fuel. That should give us life. That should be um, what gives me strength, what gives you strength throughout all of our days. And it really was for me this week, right? And so as we are coming into Easter next week and throughout this week, I just wanted us to kind of dwell on this, right? As Good Friday is coming, as 
Saturday is coming, as Sunday comes and God is, and Jesus is resurrected, right? Let's take time this week to, you know, spend time with God and Jesus and in the Spirit to really realize all these things that God did for us, right, and what Jesus did for us to bring us uh, ultimately into his kingdom and into this inheritance. And so praise team, you guys can come up. It was a little shorter than I thought. I talked really fast. Um, so yeah, let's just take maybe a little bit longer time of prayer then. Um, I'm finding that in this season, you know, I found so much hope in Jesus through this text, right, and through this story. How wonderful and how gracious is God to, you know, make this covenant, to bring us into this covenant and really show that we are all one, that we are all this body, that we are all singular because of Jesus, right? And so as the praise team is preparing and ready and getting ready to go, I think for us, I wanted us um, first to pray for really this joy that can be found in God, right? this joy that can be found in Jesus. I think it holds so much power when we move around our days. When we talk about that special uh, uh, incense or the specialness, right, I think it comes and it begins with, one, faith in Jesus, and two, it comes from this joy of knowing Jesus, right? The joy of following Jesus. The joy in seeing how wonderful this whole story is, how wonderful God has been to us. And so, yeah, just for our first uh, time of prayer, let's just pray for this joy, right? Um, you know, it, 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 the world's very tough. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of uh, despair and struggle and suffering. But for us, what we can cling on to is, is Jesus. That's what we can cling on to. Let's, let's put our hope in Jesus. Let's put our faith in Jesus. And I pray that he will reveal all these things to us, right? He will reveal how broken we are without him, how much more we need to depend on him, and how much more joy we can find in him. And so, yeah, let's just make that our first prayer topic. Let's just pray for this promise of faith that it will bring us joy. Let's pray. time to one ask for the spirits the holy spirit's help in this week right that as we are preparing our our hearts for holy week as we are readying ourselves for the for the coming of jesus right may the holy spirit just just work in us this week right let's ask for the holy spirit to change things that he needs to change let's uh, uh give him these things let's surrender let's submit these things to him right that next Sunday as, as Jesus is, is going to come, that we may really come to an understanding of this power, that we will come to an understanding of, yeah, why we need Jesus so badly, why I need him so badly, 
why without him I would be lost, that without him I would be uh, hopeless, right? Like with the song we sang earlier, that one day in his courts is better, right? So let's ask for that Holy Spirit's help. Let's ask for the help. Let's pray. prayer or just meditation however you want to uh, spend this time um, yeah one thing that God really points out to me this week was you know where is does where am I aligning myself in this world right what am I doing in this world where is my heart you know really focused on right where does this tunnel that I'm looking through end it came about through this reading of this book right it talked a lot about um, just different crises and trauma and suffering that we go through. But through the midst of these things, where is our mind at? Where are we uh, looking towards? What is the perspective that we see through all these struggles, right? It talked about so many uh, hard things that people were going through, but they found themselves, you know, aligned with God. They found themselves looking to God through all these things. And all the, the hard things that they were going through were so easy. It was joyful. They found joy in the midst of their hardship, right? One thing especially it, it taught me, I told Nat this earlier this week, is that um, it talked a lot about um, pride, right, and comparing ourselves to others. It talked about uh, uh, why we have this need to look around and see what other people are doing and how successful they are, how their grades are, right? And what it simply said to do was just look up right when we catch ourselves doing these things when we catch ourselves um, comparing or prideful when we catch ourselves even uh, uh, the other way like feeling shame and feeling um, unworthy all these things can not be solved but can ultimately really be helped and, and pushed by just looking up right if we fix our eyes on Jesus if we fix our eyes on God and the Holy Spirit, these things will become easier. Not that they'll disappear, because they won't, because we're still in this world, but it will become easier to bear these burdens with Jesus, right? And so for this last time, let's look up to God, right? Maybe physically, if that's what you need to do, but of course, metaphorically, let's, let's look up, right? Let's look up to see what He is doing looking up to put our hope in that, right? Put our hope in God, put our hope in Jesus. Take some time to just align yourself, right? All right, this is where God wants us to be, but we might be a little bit left, we might be a little right, we might be up or down, but come back to the center, right? Come back to the center, which is Jesus, which is God, which is our Father, which is this promise that is given to us by faith. So yeah, let's just take some time to do that.
You're
Yeah, just some last thoughts while we were worshiping. This promise of faith applies to all of us. You might not think that it applies to you just because of some things, but it applies to all of us, right? And that's who Jesus is, and that's what the Spirit does. It applies to every single one of us. It is for every single one of us as long as we believe. And so, yeah, I just hope that this word was a little bit of an encouragement to you guys. Um, yeah. So we will see you guys actually next week for those who are coming. We'll still be live streaming just as normal, but you'll see some outside stuff. Amen. And if you're coming next week, dress nice. We're going to think of some way to take a socially distance uh, group picture. We'll think of the logistics, so look good. Um, take a shower. Do all those things that we need to do. Uh, and yeah, let's keep Pastor Dan in your prayers too as he's going to be coming back later this week and he's continuing his rest no small group today because Pastor Dan is resting. Um, yeah, so just be blessed this week as we are entering Holy Week. Thank you, guys. We miss you guys. Claps. Thank you. Amen. Woo!